Welcome to today's episode of the Psychedelic Mom Podcast. I'm here today with Robert Forte. How are you doing? Hey, I'm great, Michaela. Really nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. I just know that you're back from some really fascinating travels from Greece. So I'm dying to hear about that later in our conversation. I think you were uh, kind of looking into the Eleusinian mysteries. Yeah, the Eleusinian mysteries. Yep. The beginning of our psychedelic movement in Western civilization. That's right. And as we begin today in this conversation, you um, had many relationships with some of the key figures in history in the psychedelic movement in the United States. And so we're going to talk about kind of the early psychedelic movement, the current psychedelic movement, and where we're headed. But first, I want to introduce you because you have an incredible background. So I just want our audience to know who you are and what you've done. Um, so Robert, you've traveled extensively, and you've been kind of part of this psychedelic path for 45 years, and really led to an adventure in consciousness and your own personal use of psychedelics for growth and development. You've been a student, a researcher, a producer, and a distributor of forbidden drugs. You taught at university and graduate level. You've done field work in South America. I know you're an author. Um, and gosh, what else do we want to talk about as far as your uh, background goes? Is there something else that you want to add there? Well, I know I've done all those things and I'm really just getting started, it feels like. I mean, this is a field that um, when I became interested in psychedelics um, as an adult uh, in like 1978, 79, this was, um, nothing was going on in the culture. There, were, there weren't really any books being written, research was blocked, there were no courses, it was kind of a forbidden subject. And so I had to, I became very deeply curious and had to run around and meet people and, and uh, organize gatherings and have people come together and start talking about this again. And now, you know, 40 something years later, it's one, it's like a booming business. It's a multi-billion dollar business. There are programs at the leading universities. I was just at Harvard yesterday. They're getting a flood of millions of dollars, Berkeley. NYU. It's amazing what's happened. And, it um, and I'm just you getting involved. Yeah, I originally reached out to you because in the psychedelic movement, um, it's all glitz and glitter at the moment. It's the psychedelic renaissance, the magic pill for everything. You know, legalization is moving across the country. And I was curious whether anybody was talking about another side of psychedelics. Um, because as we were just saying, they can be incredible potential tools for growth and transformation, but there's other aspects to these tools. And so when you, what brought you first to being so interested in gathering people, wasn't an experience younger with a psychedelic, what brought you into this space originally back then? Well, <clears throat> you know, when you say originally, I, I feel like I was sort of destined or called into this subject Really, when I was a very young boy, when I was just 10 years old, I had to do, I've told this story before, but I, I had to do a, a report for my um, current events. It was my day to do a presentation on current events. And so I just grabbed a magazine on my way out the door to school, and it was the magazine with um, Look Magazine with LSD on the cover. I didn't even know what LSD was. I just grabbed it because I was attracted to the colors. And I brought it in, and I and I, I said to my teacher, Miss McCloy, I said, "Well, what is LSD anyway? What does LSD stand for?" And she looked at me and had this little smile, and she said, <laughs> "Let's save democracy." I was just a Whoa. little, like ten or eleven year old boy, and that went right over my head. But it's you know, it kind of struck me like what? And so I was always had this little curiosity. And then is then you know I'm 66 years old so I was growing up during the 60s but I was very young and the, I saw the the drugs that came into our community in northern New Jersey where I grew up and kids started taking them and I was very frightened because I didn't see any positive effects people were just kind of getting freaked out and getting leading into other drugs and it was scary to me 
But it wasn't until my third year of college that I had become interested in meditation and it had a very profound and positive effect on my life and my ability to concentrate. And so I became curious, who figured out meditation? How did ancient people figure out these very simple technologies for stilling the mind that led to these profound metaphysical insights? And so I took a course in the history of Indian religion, and that's where I learned that psychedelic drugs, that mushrooms had a role in stimulating ancient minds into these dimensions. And then it just was like a light went off, like, wow, I want to learn everything about that. And it was the beginning of my, my career, really. That was, that was 1978 in New York City. Wow. And so um, again, like I'm saying, that was a time like psychedelic drugs had this huge impact, sensational, hysterical impact on our culture in the 60s and 70s. But all that had kind of stopped. No one was talking about them. The movement went away. And so me and a few other people that I began to connect with really kind of started this new movement that they call the psychedelic renaissance now. So it's, you know, it's really exciting to... uh, so it. when you had this original pull, this spontaneous moment at uh, 10, seeing LSD on the cover of a magazine, and then hearing this, like, let's save democracy. It's an interesting even line for our times in history when yeah. there's a lot of political movement toward totalitarian governments. Mm-hmm. So it's very interesting that in some ways we're in a psychedelic renaissance. Then you had this Similar to me, it was like once I knew that these were foundations for kind of spiritual tools that were historic and de- through centuries, that was kind of my hook. Like, oh my gosh, I want to find out more. What was your first psychedelic experience like that then made you kind of gather a group together and say, we need to bring this forward? You know, for me, it was really just kind of magical. I, that first day of class at Columbia, I thought, wow, I'm going to learn about this. I went to the bookstore and found a book by Alan Watts, The Joyous Cosmology, who had a preface by Timothy Leary. Well, first the professor at Columbia wrote the name Gordon Wasson on the board. And he was the Wall Street banker who first really introduced the psychedelic mushroom into society. And I thought that was very weird. He was a Wall Street banker, and he kind of started this psychedelic thing that happened in the 60s. Like that was interesting. And I and then I never forget. In fact, I I just came back from Greece where I spent several days with Gordon Wasson's great nephew, who's making a movie about him. And I was he was interviewing me. And I, I still remember the way the professor wrote the name on the board, that that just was struck me. And little did I know that in just a couple years, I would be hanging out with Gordon Wasson at his home in Connecticut. And then I went and found this book, Timothy Leary. Like Timothy Leary was just sort of a a comic character to me. The 60s, you know, he was really lampooned. And first he was was lampooned in the press and he was, you know, made out to be a very, you know, almost pitiful character to me. That's what I thought of Byrne, once a Harvard professor, then he got all messed up with drugs, was arrested and chased by the cops, you know, and he's kind of a pitiful character. That was my first impression. And then, you know, just a few years later, I would get to know Timothy Leary very, very well, meeting him personally and having this long relationship with a man that was his best friend and one of the most important psychologists of the last century. So really getting deeply into all aspects of this psychedelic phenomenon, meeting the people personally, living with them in their house, uh, becoming friends with them, tripping with them, going through their archives. And um, you know, I think back on this, it's been 40 years, but it's still, as I'm saying, it's still such a, a rapidly unfolding phenomena on so many levels. That I've I've taken to um, you know I'm writing a book now, and I'm calling the book "The Altered States of America," but the mm. subtitle of the book is "Psychedelic Movements of the 20th and 21st Century" because 
we can talk about one family. We all agree there's one family of drugs. Those are the psychedelic drugs. But there's not a psychedelic movement. There are psychedelic movements. There are different groups of people that use these drugs for very different reasons, sometimes opposite conflicting reasons. And I think this is you know, something that we're going to talk about here because, yes, it's true that the drugs have a very dramatic and unique therapeutic effect in some circumstances. But we also have to acknowledge that the drugs are used as weapons. They're used they're, and, and the introduction of them into the United States in the early, in the 50s and 60s was a combination of these things. We're really just starting to, you know, tease apart the different aspects and the people and their connections and why were they doing what they were doing and who were their affiliates. And it's very complicated. And it's, um, so that's my new chore to help sort that out. Amazing. So what did you learn from your relationships with these greats? And were they aware of these two sides of psychedelics and what were going on? I heard in one of your interviews about you know, an, another side of Timothy Leary that many people don't really talk about. So what did you learn being in that proximity to these group of men? Well, you learn that the, um, what gets portrayed to the public, either through books or through the media, is very different than what is true. A very um, pertinent example. Um, Yesterday, in the New York Times, there was an obituary for a very fine man, Roland Griffiths. Of course, I knew Roland. We had a, not a very deep relationship, but we had connected and corresponded. And my first book was used to be a, um, to draw attention and raise money for the Johns Hopkins project that he was the director of. And um, a wonderful fellow, the New York Times wrote a very long and appreciative obituary for him. And, and um, people are spreading it all over Facebook and various social medias and, you know, what a great pioneer Roland was. And, and um, see, Roland, but there's a paragraph in there about Timothy Leary and comparing Timothy to the Timothy, Le you know, you, if you read the narrative in the media today about psychedelics, every, all the problems were because of Timothy Leary. You know, Michael Pollan's book. Oh, the psychedelics were, here's the narrative. My, psychedelics were discovered back in the 40s and 50s by, by Europeans, by modern society. They were gradually being introduced into the culture. Gordon Wasson wrote the famous article. Then they started to do research and found they had psychotherapeutic values. And then Timothy Leary guts a hold of them at Harvard and blows it. And so the paragraph in the New York Times was, Timothy Leary got fired from Harvard for distributing LSD to students with a messianic fervor. That's the quote in the New York Times wow. from the obituary. It's completely untrue. Timothy Leary never did LSD at Harvard. He wasn't fired for doing psychedelic research. Actually, LSD was being distributed very recklessly at Harvard 10 years before Timothy Leary ever got there by the CIA. Wow. In the first LSD research in the United States was the most sloppy, careless, reckless form of research you've ever heard of where CIA doctors took out an ad in the Harvard Crimson and invited anybody, <clears throat> undergraduates, <clears throat> anybody that wanted for $25 to take this drug that would make you temporarily insane. That's how the recklessness of LSD got started by the government in the CIA. It was not Timothy Leary. Now, was that part of MKUltra? Yes, that was part of MKUltra. Yes. That was like the beginning of MKUltra. Now, MKUltra, <clears throat> you know, we, we think people that you know, study the subject. We think that MK Ultra is just this, these random, nefarious, even diabolical experiments that the CIA performed on prisoners or 
on unsuspecting customers of prostitutes. But MKUltra was much huger than that. MKUltra was a plan to really intoxicate America. Ultra mind control, that's what that stands for. And the roots of it go much further back. And um, that's, a, that's a very big subject. Let's just bookmark that for now because yeah, I want to we'll stay with your question that. and the personalities in the people. Yes. And the public story, the public narrative, the script, and what's really going on. Like Timothy Leary is the one that's blamed. He's the scapegoat for the sure. problem. Nixon said he was the most dangerous man in America. Yeah. Pretty big title. <laughs> yeah, I know. And that was my impression when I, as I, when on my first, my first pass through the subject. Oh yeah, we were doing research. I wanted to do research. It wasn't for Tim being so, you know, exuberant and you know that we could. I would be able to do research as a graduate student with psychedelics. And then I got to know him, and I got to really understand a lot more of what was going on, and. Like I'm saying, it's it's a challenge for me because so many of us who love this subject have been fed a load of shit about it. And I've gone deeper into it, knowing the characters and reading than just about anybody I know. So I'm trying to tell so this story. what would you like people to know, <laughs> yeah, about these greats that they don't know where the stories have been distorted? Okay, that's a good question. And here, so the first thing, my first answer to that is that I want, I want people to understand that there are different movements. Look, it's like the history of religion in general. Religion is one of the most powerful and wonderful forces in all of humanity. Think of all the great stuff that we can learn about in the history of religion. Love thy neighbor as thyself, uh, meditation practices, ideas about immortality and human fulfillment and ethical systems, like all this wonderful, wonderful stuff in the history of religion. But also in the history of religion, there's the very opposite of that. There are these ideologies and, and um, superstitions and indoctrinations, and religion has the very opposite effect. So there's a whole spectrum in the, in the history of religion. And and psychedelics are a microcosm of that, like you said before. It's like you see the whole history of religion is kind of contained in that, from the visionary experience, but then again, the use of drugs in mind control and indoctrination and in confusion, and they can have the opposite effect of what they are branded or advertised to have. And, um, you know, it's, it's tricky to talk about because... Um, stuff gets into realms that people consider negative. And I get a reputation for being, you know, like, it's a psychedelic renaissance, like, EA, let's everybody take psychedelic drugs. Like, no, 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 no. It's, it's, um, it's a lot more complicated than that. There's a lot more nuance to it. And let's, let's step back and really exercise discernment and see what's going on before we get too carried away. So, like, one thing I like to point out is... Um, one of the main characters in the psychedelic movement overall is Aldous Huxley. We all had to read Aldous Huxley when we were kids in high school and his great books, Brave New World. And, you know, then we get into psychedelics and everybody's like, The Doors of Perception, what a great book that is. And it was groundbreaking and important. But let's step back a little bit and look at Huxley a little more, a little more clearly, a little more critically. He not only wrote Brave New World, right? Brave New World is one of the best-selling novels of all time. It's also one of the most um, banned books in America. But here's Brave New World that he writes in 1938. And it's a story about a future society, 600 years in the future, where all the wealth is controlled by a very small number of people at the top of the pyramid, the world controllers, Huxley calls them. But all the rest of the people down here underneath the pyramid, most of them live in like little tiny boxes and they've got these dumb, meaningless jobs or just cogs in this big wheel. But nobody does anything about it. There's no political rebellion. There's no social justice movements. 
So the wealth is still constant. Well, why don't these people do anything? Well, Huxley says, because whenever they get upset about their predicament, how come you go? They are told to go, they're given this drug. In Huxley's novel, it's called Soma. And this is 1938 that Huxley's published this book. We didn't really know much about psychedelic drugs then, but Soma is a psychedelic drug. Soma is a drug that, Soma is like MDMA. Soma is a drug that makes you feel that everything is okay, even when everything is not okay. You forgive, you're, they're, so they're, to, they're told to go on these Soma holidays and, f and fuck their brains out. Not have intimate relationships, just like random, repeated sexual contact with people. It's like Burning Man. Burning Man. <laughs> it's like they, they're, yeah. they're required to go to something like Burning Man anytime they get depressed. Interesting. Yeah. So that's what Huxley writes in 38. And then in 58, Aldous Huxley writes a little um, addendum, an essay. People that want to, you know, listen to what I'm saying. I say, read Brave New World Revisited, 1958. You can Google it. You know, this is another thing about modernity. You know, I was a kid just becoming a scholar and someone mentioned a title. You had to go find some great library that had it. You know, that's why we went right. to universities like Chicago or Harvard or Yale because they had all the great books. Now you just push right. a few little buttons on your keyboard Button. and you get the it's whole... It's right here. Light. Yeah, so you can, <laughs> anybody can get this. Brave New World Revisited. New World. And Huxley says that, oh my God, you know, I wrote Brave New World thinking it was 600 years in the future, but actually it's happening already. And the Soma that I warned about is LSD. LSD is the newest form of Soma. And so here, look at today. We, I call, you know, when... We call it MK Ultra, but I also call it the Brave New World Project. And when you look carefully at the people and the institutions that, that were behind the propagation of psychedelic drugs in the 50s, they're the billionaires, they're the, they're the super elite, they're the CIA. It wasn't, it was a, it was a, it was a ruse, it was a psyop that was inflicted on us to somatize us, throw fairy dust in our eyes so that people were distracted from the m much more serious and dire political movements that were underway in the, in the growing totalitarian fascism that we are now, you know, like right in the thick of. If it weren't for Timothy Leary, you, you look at the narrative in the media, like every article that the New York Times writes or any article in the mainstream media or Michael Pollan, who's a shill in this Brave New World project, they all repeat the same thing. They were doing great until Timothy Leary blew it. What Tim says, that his greatest achievement was wrestling the drugs away from the CIA and democratizing them, taking them out of institutional control and giving them to the people. But, and giving them to the people, not just the drugs, the set and setting, the mean. Right. Tim, Tim didn't just say, take psychedelic drugs. He said, take psychedelic drugs, turn on, tune in, drop out of that socially constructed reality of the military industrial right. complex, create your own religion, question authority, think for yourselves. He popularized these drugs with means that changed them from weapons of the establishment to tools of a transformational movement. And that's why Nixon called him the most dangerous. Nixon didn't call him the dangerous man in the world. Nixon was fed those lines right. by, his, by his social engineers in the CIA. And Leary knew. Leary was, see, Leary was a brilliant psychologist. He was he was originally funded by the CIA. He was recruited by the CIA back in the late 1940s. To, um, so he knew the CIA's playbook. He knew what was going on. He knew what was happening to contemporary society. And when he realized how he was being used, that, that really pissed him off and it started his movement. Wow, wild. So, so when you look at today's movement, right? 
mm-hmm. you know, legalization isn't really legalization, I would say. It's almost a monopoly mm-hmm. that, you know, like MDMA with MAPS is a monopoly at this point. Um, it's not really mm-hmm. legalization. Actually, speaking of that, let's go back to a time period where you were <laughs> legally um, distributing MDMA. So let's talk a yeah. little bit <clears throat> about that. And then from there, maybe what we could do is talk about, again, so we have like Timothy Leary, some truer story about him, what was really going on at the time to today's time and what's actually going on and are they mirroring each other in some ways? They are very much. It's what's what's happened with, um, what happened with LSD back in the 60s we saw again happening with MDMA in the uh, early 1980s. And yeah, I was right in the middle of it. So it was, it was legal? Um, it was legal. It's another example of just these kind of magical things that happened uh, in my life. I was, um, I was living at the Esalen Institute, and I was, a, um, I was a student and assistant to Stanislav Grof. I was um, kind of his right-hand another man. big name. Yeah learning how to do LSD therapy and helping him in his workshops and developing the holotropic breathing that's now become a very big thing, setting up this group called the uh, Spiritual Emergence Network. And, um, you know, I was just a kid in my early 20s. I graduated from college and somebody gave me MDMA. And I took it with my girlfriend at a Halloween party at Esalen. Still very few people knew about this drug, 1981, Halloween. And it was um, amazing, of course. And so I told Stan, like, oh my God, I had this new stuff. This is incredible. This is the drug. This will be the new, if we want to reintroduce psychedelics into research and into society, this is going to be the drug because it's gentle, doesn't like you don't get you know buried in your unconscious and all these mystical things it's very gentle and opens your heart and like oh my god he said well if you want to know more about mdma you have to go up to you have to meet alexander shulgin this um wise and you know chemist up at university of california berkeley so i just you know i had checked up to berkeley and went to meet alexander shulgin you know what an amazing character and he, um, he said, what can I do for you? And I said, well, I would, um, I had some MDMA and I hear you're the guy behind that. And, um, I'd love to get some more from you. And he laughed and he said, oh no, I couldn't do that. But we talked for a little while and he said, well, I can uh, teach you how to make it. So he taught me and a few of my friends, I'm not a chemist, but I found some PhDs in chemistry from the university and we set up a lab. And the next thing I know, for a $500 investment, I had a kilogram of MDMA, pure, pharmaceutically pure MDMA that was not illegal. And so I began a project, which was um, Sasha wanted us to keep it underground. We wanted to learn from the mistakes of the 60s. And the 60s mistakes were Leary was just a little too public with this stuff and provoked a, a negative reaction from the society. So we wanted it to be an underground movement that would grow. So I had this project. It was an underground project with MDMA, and we would turn people on, ask them not to speak about it, just write a report. And this movement began to grow underground, and it was a beautiful mystery school, this new sacred drug. And like, I don't know how many people we turned on in that project. who were you turning on? Well, it was um, it was just like trusting in the flow of what was going on. Who like, showed? You know, um, people that came to Esalen, um, my professors, psychotherapists, um, but sometimes just random people. Like I love to tell this story of walking into a. I was on a ski trip in Aspen and walked into a bar, and the only person sitting at the bar was um, Jack Nicholson. <laughs> so I, s- got, uh, I started a conversation oh with Jack and I turned Jack on and then Jack introduced me to all of his friends and I made these wonderful connections with, you know, you can imagine the people that hung out with Nicholson. You seem to be day. at the right place at the right time. I'm telling you, it was just like a magical period. That's just one example of um, 
of that happening. And then um, almost as quickly as that magic happened and was flowing, um, you mentioned MAP. So like one of my kind of arch rivals in the field of psychedelics is Rick Doblin because of all the um, hundreds of people that were turned on to MDMA in my project and all of them obeyed the agreement to be silent about it. Rick took it on himself to be a popularizer of MDMA. And not only did he violate the agreement, he, um, he called the government. He called Reagan's drug czar. He called the media, appointing himself the Timothy Leary of the 80s, telling, telling all these that there was this not illegal love drug that therapists were using in Northern California and they were coming out of the Esalen Institute and it was, he, he blew the secret. He basically snitched on us. And that and was what, what was his goal? Well, you know, Rick's goal has always been to just make a lot of money. He was a, he was a kind of money hungry drug dealer. You know, he was like a, a playboy, money loving, drug loving person. Wow, his image out in the psychedelic renaissance today is completely different. Yeah, I know. It's hilarious. He's kind of the hero of the movement in a lot of ways of bringing these psychedelics to more people to do therapeutic healing. Yeah, it's just a line of shit. You know, if you look, you look critically at Rick's career over, you know, and then this is how he started MAPS. He, he knew what I was doing, the secret project, and then he started to do the same thing. But he uh, ingratiated himself to the government, snitched us out. Um, you know, he now, would, do you when, ever talk to him? I, you know, I just saw him for the first time a few months ago. And we're friendly to each other. We're sort of like brothers. You know, we were close for a little while back then, but I realized what was going on with him. And I wanted to continue. I stayed far away from him and I stayed underground doing what I was doing. My approach is really very opposite his. And it's been astonishing to me that so many people were able to um, fall for his stuff, that they, uh, you know, he's begging for money. He's always soliciting money from the counterculture to make MDMA legal. He's um, not trying to make it legal. He's trying to control it. Right. He doesn't do anything for the people. No, he's well, trying we to were control. just talking about with Timothy Leary, right? Totally so the opposite. Timothy Leary was taking taking it out of the hands of government, big institutions, and giving it more to people, in some ways, that's exactly what's happening with MAPS is, you know, legalization in Colorado looks more like a monopoly, right? Yeah. Where yeah. if, like when MDMA is legal in Colorado, I don't know if a lot of people know this, that they won't just be able to take MDMA in Colorado. No. Um, I think that at MAPS is going to be the manufacturer of MDMA. Is this true? Mm -hmm. The distributor, manufacturer. And then you'll have to use a MAPS trained therapist and maybe a MAPS certified, right. you know, clinic. Is yeah. that true? Yep. Yeah. And it will yeah. cost you <clears throat> it will cost you something like fifteen thousand dollars to have a few sessions with MDMA. Now look, I've been in, I was in the MDMA business for a long time. It cost like pennies to make to make the stuff. Rick got his for free. And now and now if if you wanted to take MDMA if, and if you want to become a certified MAPS therapist, you have to pay several thousand dollars more to Rick to teach to become an MDMA therapist, which is the simplest thing in the world, we used to just call it babysitting. I mean, it's not it's not that complicated. People that just a kind heart can do it, you know. But it's well, I mean, some people are saying we are like over psychologicalizing these yeah. medicines. Like in some way, the Western model, this Western big pharma, big yeah. government, industrial, military industrial complex is superimposing itself on these beautiful earth medicines that in some ways are the most powerful tools for transformation for our society. That have been used and, for thousands of years, yeah. you know, without all this hierarchy and everything that's going on. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that, and what, what is exciting to me now that I've been speaking out more and meeting people like you is that 
how many, there are many more people like us who see through this farce, this so-called legalization farce, you know, and then it, more discernment, you know, there's a big difference between kind of what Rick is trying to do, which is control versus the decriminalization movements, right. which make a lot more sense to me. Yeah. Just take, I mean, the problem goes right back to the Controlled Substance Act of 1970 when Nixon made that law and made these drugs illegal. Just strike that law. That's complete bullshit. Let the people. So, would you believe that everybody has the sovereign right to use psychedelics and drugs? Should there be any government involvement in what somebody can put in their body? No, I don't think so. I, I'm, you know, yeah. like. We're talking now, and you know, I'm living outside of Boston here, where we, you know, had an American Revolution, and we we started our own country right. based on the idea of freedom of religion. Freedom. Let no Congress can pass no law between an individual and their religious experience. That's one way to look at it, and another way to look at it is, I make this comparison a lot. Like the psychedelic experience and psychedelic drugs are like love; they're like sex. That's something between me and responsible partners. Yeah, you can abuse sex. That's terrible. Well, we have laws for that. We have, we have laws. You don't need any more laws. We, we're yeah. responsible adults, and we have a right to privacy, and we can make mistakes. We just can't hurt other people. Like it's, completely, it's a complete contrivance, this whole edifice of drug policy. And, and this is another thing where, just to get hit on Rick a little bit more is that, um, you know, there's this mistaken notion that the government, the DEA, the FDA made psychedelic drugs illegal to protect people. They didn't, that's not why drugs are not illegal to protect people, to stop people from using them. When drugs are illegal, they're very, very expensive and they're controlled by a criminal syndicates that are beholden to the government. So I heard you say that there are certain drugs controlled by certain countries. Is that true? Like MDMA, for example, how is that controlled by another country other than the United States? Well, I think what you're getting at is that... Um, so a very important book. If I was going to be teaching a graduate level course on this, one of the books that I would, on drug policy and psychedelic drug policy, one of the books that would be required reading would be a book called The Politics of Heroin of Southeast Asia. And the book began as a dissertation by Alfred McCoy in history at Yale. It became a book and he's had a long distinguished career in um, teaching history at the University of Wisconsin. The politics of heroin in Southeast Asia is about the beginning of the heroin business and how that is controlled by the CIA. Heroin is illegal because the CIA then gets to control the commerce of it. Okay. Another very important book is a book by Gary Webb called Dark Alliance, another award-winning book exposing the CIA's participation in the crack cocaine epidemic. Okay, so that book has not been written yet for the psychedelic drug market, but it's the same thing, that the psychedelic drugs were made illegal because that way the commerce of them is controlled not in an open free market by scientists and researchers, but it's, con it's forbidden and illegal. So they're controlled by criminals with connections with things like the CIA. And in the case of MDMA, MDMA is really, <clears throat> and I'm not the one that's introducing this notion. You can, another thing you can just Google, um, MDMA, Mossad, it's, it's, it's really Israeli intelligence, like the, the bulk of the international MDMA criminal production and distribution is Israeli organized crime. So then can these governments and CIA organizations, can they basically target certain audiences to, for example, the crack cocaine 
in the United States certainly kept the black culture uh, right. down and the yeah. inner cities became, you know, very flooded with cocaine and crack cocaine. Right. If you look at the past to present moment, what's going on? What are your deepest concerns? What would you want people to be, to be able to discern in what's actually happening in the United States in the psychedelic movement? Yeah. Well, um, so first of all, that's really important to point out what you just did that, um, and that's what McCoy points out in the politics of heroin in the, um, post-war period, blacks were, went to fight for the allies were coming back from world war II. They were war heroes. They came back to their inner cities and they were empowered and they were going to begin to institute political changes and help out their communities. But this is politically threatening to some people. And so right after that, we saw this, you know, epidemic of heroin flooding the cities. And this is what McCoy gets into. So you see, it has both a um, political purpose and an economic purpose. And it's the same with the crack cocaine that Gary Webb gets into. Now, when we slide this analysis over into the psychedelic world, it becomes a little more complicated because, um, Because look, look, I mean, all the different ways that tyrants have controlled populations throughout history, uh, throwing psychedelic drugs at them is really rather kind because they often work. I mean, again, look at Huxley's novel. Right. And, um, you know, I, I had a long conversation with my friend Brian Murrescu, who's written The Immortality Key. Spent a few hours with him yesterday, and we were talking about this. And, uh, you know, these are my ideas and not Brian's, but that the, we're in a, you know, modern civilization is in a, is, a, is really very fucked up right now. Like it may be so fucked up that it's hard to imagine solutions to it. Sort of like I make the comparison of um, if you're a doctor and you're working with a patient who has cancer and you're gonna do everything you can to help that person. But sometimes you reach a point where you can't help them anymore. And your right. care your care shifts from palliative care to hospice, where you just wanna keep the patient comfortable and practice kindness and help them let go. Right into what's next and so i don't know like i'm going through this kind of you know these last few weeks have been this so dramatic kind of existential this, yeah it's really very existential and it's you know it's kind of weird for me to talk about it because i'm 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 like i'm one of the people that's kind of on the top of the pyramid being a kind of rich white male and um i'm a beneficiary i'm a, my ego is a beneficiary of the wealth that's been generated by capitalism Right. And there are a lot of, there, I just can't imagine there's going to be an economic or social solution to this imbalance of wealth and the power of the military and, um, and the depression that is going to be like, we need some, we need to do something to help all these people. And, right. And, um, we have an epidemic of depression and isolation and suicide and existential angst. Yeah. And, and so, you know, a few months ago, I would have been, I was more critical about the psychedelic thing because it's just like, you know, trying to anesthetize all these people instead of, you know, all these workshops on microdosing. I was thinking we should have workshops on, you know, organizing voters and on uh, political justice. And um, <clears throat> now I'm, you know, kind of thinking, man, you know, there, maybe there, maybe for people to become mystics sooner than later, and and begin to let go of the crises the that you know what I'm trying to say. It's I'm not, these thoughts are not very well formed because um, I'm in a process. So okay, let me yeah, let me see. So basically, you come with the history, the knowledge of the history within the psychedelic movement in the Western form of psychedelics how drugs and psychedelics have been used for mind control, but have the potential to do great good. Some concerns about what's actually happening in the Western model of the psychedelic Renaissance movement 
and yet a window of hope <laughs> that even in a model that's not necessarily uh, democratized, and at the level of people and at the level of decriminalization and true sovereignty, that maybe still these psychedelics could be the tool that awakens people to the systems that need change, wake kind of a, a quickening of an awakening process. Is that the window there that you're looking into? Yeah, it is in a way. I mean, I'm, I, I've always, it's like a swirling mosaic of possibilities now uh, um, in this world and, and um, again, really kind of um, punctuated over the last few weeks with this war that Trip. is brewing in the Middle East really has a bit. So I've had visions on my various journeys uh, of a period at, during our lifetime where we're really going to be um, just massive catastrophes of uh, economic and environmental and these, um, you know, prophetic sort of um, apocalyptic, right? And apocalypse is a curious word, Funny word in the history it? of religion because it, it really means um, revelation. It means revelation. Dropping of the, the veils, yes. Dropping the veils. Right? And... Um, when you, Certainly psychedelics and earth medicines do that. Yeah. When you drop the veil, you, you see everything and it's not all wonderful, you know, mm -hmm. like the, it, it, it has to do with, uh, you know, an integration, facing an integration of the shadow. And um, it's like a birth experience, like a birth experience gives us a newborn, but it wasn't easy to get there. You know, that baby passed through the mother, we, that's, a, that's a crisis. And so we're in that sort of crisis point, it seems to me, yeah. in our in our modern society. And so we're going to see we're going to see um, more intensification of evil and a greater intensification of light. We're seeing it now. We're seeing right now we're in Washington, now. Washington D.C. is the largest um, gathering of uh, Jewish peace activists protesting Israelis' retaliation to right. Hamas. Right. Right. Amazing, I, huh? You know, I remember a few years ago, I marched in. I marched with five hundred thousand people in New York City to protest the Iraq War. It didn't stop the Iraq War, but just to be in that community of half a million people, all with their hearts open and praying for peace. That's really beautiful. And so, can psychedelic drugs help activate that sort of awakening and kind of political sense in our society? I don't know. Um, what, what, what do you see in your, in your psychedelic community? I mean, I, I'm not, I I'm see not sure what to make of it. a couple of things that are kind of fascinating that I don't know what to make of either, just even with clients where there's, if I had said this three years ago or heard someone say this, I'd be like, okay, wacko. <laughs> but what I'm noticing is just even with clients that something that might have taken a psychedelic, you just talked about the shadow, to even be able to get to it um, is right there. It's like on the surface, just doing somatic inquiry is, uh, I'm noticing, and I'm curious, is like there a, an expansion of consciousness? Is there a quickening of an awakening process? But I'm seeing clients that might have taken years to go through some healing on some major trauma or have a deeper understanding of non-duality or a sense of what consciousness is, has really shifted. Um, yet at the same time, I'm seeing some of the same things that you are. I think, I mean, similar to you, I'm like, why, you know, I was have not obviously been in the psychedelic movement as long as you have. But when I was, nobody was really talking about psychedelics, right? It was still very underground. So what I've seen in a very short period of time is, oh my gosh, CNN's talking about it. Oh my gosh, uh, it's on the cover of this magazine and this magazine and this university. And there, that makes me really curious about what's happening. So I'm seeing both. I'm seeing kind of this 
worry about the way the movement is going, but not enough people talking about it. Even when legalization of Colorado happened, it was like everybody was celebrating. And I'm like, this isn't a celebration. We have sovereign rights already to use these medicines, but we're celebrating that a government that we elected is giving us this much (laughs) right to use these. So, Mm -hmm. and then people will say, well, it's an opening. It's in a beginning. To me, it's like giving prisoners great food and, you know, it's it's kind of like that. It's like, oh, well, before we had rice and now we're getting gourmet food. Well, it's like, well, we're supposed to be free anyway <laughs> to choose what we want to eat. Yeah, that's very and well And so put. there's this quickening in consciousness that I am seeing. Um, a lot more people. Okay, here's the good news of even the book, How to Change Your Mind. It would like drive me crazy because it's like here people have been – using psychedelics, indigenous people have been using psychedelics for centuries. And here's, you know, this book written by a white man getting all the attention about psychedelics and earth medicines. In my opinion, it's like if we can combine and hear more from the indigenous wisdom of the people that have been using these medicines for centuries, if they get a voice at the table, And it's not just one group. And I say this, I remember saying to you, like, I'm a white woman. I don't want to be part of the problem as the psychedelic mom. Like, I don't want to be promoting the red magic pill, you know? So I think what I'm, what I'm feeling is how does everybody get a seat at the table? How do we actually talk about what's going on in the industrial complex of big pharma now jumping into psychedelics for money and greed and all these privatized companies where their mushrooms can grow out my back door. And so it's complex. And yet I still have hope that the profundity of these tools can be so profound. But I had someone on talking about tobacco, and I thought this was an incredible analogy. So he really works with sacred tobacco. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how tobacco was such a sacred medicine that did incredible healing. Mm -hmm. Well, when the Western industrial complex Mm -hmm. took tobacco, it's borderline poison. You know what I mean? It's a poison the most poisonous substance, one of them in America. Mm -hmm. So it's like, also Mm -hmm. do these plants have an intelligence that they don't want to be commodified? They do not want to be uh, in this kind of Mark, a marketplace, and then what happens when they are? I these yeah. are all the things that kind of yeah. are in my kind of curiosity of, you know. And then there's a part of me that's like, oh gosh, I hope that younger generations, even before they even have children, have the ability to use these earth medicines so that they can re- deprogram, so that they're raising the next generation that believes in sovereignty, believes in democracy. Um, You know, we hear things like the children of today will never even know that they had a right to privacy. They won't even know what privacy is due to all the technology. So there's all these complexities and can psychedelics heal it all? I don't know. I love how you're laying that out. Um. And that you have this podcast to share that kind of wisdom. It's, um, it really parallels my own course in this field. You know, my first book was um, a book of writings, scholarly writings, emphasizing the religious significance of psychedelic drugs. The next book was about Timothy Leary to kind of honor him. But I'm, I'm so, um, tuned into what you're saying and agree with you about the um, the capitalization, the monetization, the popularizing. And so I became more interested again in what I call the mystery school model. Yeah. And so the third book that I published is, um, is a, a re-edition of a book called The Road to Eleusis, which is about the Eleusinian mysteries. And so this is what I emphasize now. And, you know, 
we use this word, the mysteries, the religious mysteries, the Eleusinian mysteries, but let's look at the word mystery and where, what that means etymologically. And it, and it can help inform what, what I think is the right path, what I'm planning to take. A mystery means, mystery comes from the word which means to be silent, to shut your mouth and be silent. And the Eleusinian mysteries were, went on for 2,000, 1,500 years. We don't even really know how long they went on for, but this was a practice that people would go to um, receive very, we don't know for sure, but very probably a psychedelic experience, a, a, a substance that they consumed that gave a vision. And so profound was this vision that they weren't, they weren't um, allowed to talk about. You, they would have it just once in their life. It changed their life. All the greatest minds of the ancient Greek world that, that provided us with things like democracy and our scientific right. method and theater and architecture and so many things. Right. Like These Plato, were visions that Socrates. were Socrates. Everybody. All everybody. the great minds. I didn't know that they only had it once in their life. I thought it, they got it once a year. No, once in their life. Okay. They, they lose, wow. There were other mysteries. There were other practices. Okay. But the Eleusinian mysteries were once in their life. And then you could right. never and talk about it. the drink was called Kikion. The Kikion. The Kikion. Kikion. And so... Um, <clears throat> That's why I wanted to bring that book up. It's not, these aren't things that we're supposed to make money from or give them to people to pay their, you know, you, when, you, when you entangle capitalism and the profit motive into your healing practice, you know, it's a, there's this, you know, it, there's a kind of conflict of interest that takes a really, um, you know, mature person to integrate, right? Like, um, there, there's Rick Doblin on one side, like, okay, you know, you're going to cost $15,000 to have three sessions with my certified guides. Like, that's just, I mean, that's obvious, just, you know, exploitation and profiteering. And, um, but then, you know, on the other side of that, I'm really heartened by what I see is all, this development of all these underground guides all over the country and really wonderfully wise and soulful people that recognize the truly mysterious and transformative sacred part of this field and are, and are learning to do it. And so I, I love the fact that more people are becoming aware of psychedelics. There are more and more of us. And I'm quite disheartened by the, the Doblins of the world. And there are those, you know. Yeah, it's interesting. And I interviewed Snow Raven, uh, who performed at the Matt conference this year and she's from Siberia and she's a musician that brings her Saka people's language and music. Mm -hmm. And one of the things she talked about is that back when it happened, when the Russians came in, it was almost like a genocide of her people. Um, basically what happened, why they survived, why she survived and the heritage survived was underground shamans. They kept everything alive, mm. but it was underground. And it just made me think of today's time. And I remember having a really profound experience with um, Bufo toad medicine and coming back from this experience and being surrounded by the group that I had worked with for a year to learn how to serve medicine. And when I came back, you know, everybody's drumming and I'm in this circle and there was just this awareness that there's been medicine carriers through all the generations and that I was surrounded at the moment with the medicine carriers of this generation, mm -hmm. some of them anyway. And just the profundity of that, that these intelligences and the mystery of it, you were just talking about the mystery. And for me, I'm very much like you, like uh, the idea of having the Eleusinian mysteries reemerge in the world. Yeah. That would be the most exciting experience to see grandparents, mothers, fathers, greatest thinkers. I think it was the one day that slaves were also allowed to participate mm -hmm. in the mysteries so that yeah. everybody was treated mm -hmm. as an equal. Even women. And to have... Even well, women were the. Were, that was a joke. Were, <laughs> yeah. Well, let's even talk about the even women part, um, because okay, weren't the um, weren't the priestesses the ones that served the kikion? 
Yeah. No, I, I again, I just came from there. I was just had a two week immersion yeah. in the whole thing. And I, and I realized that I've had a, um, a kind of romantic, romanticized mm, okay. image of the mysteries because, um, okay. and like a typical in my own life that I'm, I'll get really interested in something and then I'll, I'll develop a critical perspective and I go, okay, I got to throw that and that keep on evolving. So I'm, I'm thinking about the Elysian mysteries and I was going around to different other sites and I was in a museum and, you know, it, ancient Greece, which we, is the, you know, basis of our own culture in so many ways. When we talk about the Lucinian mysteries, they, they're, the historians talk about them as having been a great uh, civilizing um, effect on, through these mysteries, we have become, you know, kinder and less barbaric and these, you know, these things that people say about them. But honestly, they, the Greeks were, <laughs> they were very extremely barbaric. And like every single monument, it's all about a war. And the, and the, you know, the initiates of the Eleusinian, well, you know, there's the Socrates and all the great people, who, but they, but, you know, they were, they were, um, initiated. They had these visions and then they went out and still fought wars and conquered territory and dominated people and had slaves and tree and were barbaric. And the, there was, you know, it was a very tumultuous time of period where we went from polytheistic and matriarchal or at least sexually balanced to a real patriarchal and you know fucked up world so i mean it's right. not like the eleusinian mysteries were an anti-war movement right <laughs> and that's really where i'm coming from since i was a little boy like i'm an anti-war guy like and, right. and what I, the process that i'm going through now is maybe i you just got to let go of that and just to kind of accept the fact that we live in a dualistic universe and there's good and evil, and these characters and this like thing that's going on with their bombing hospitals with money that I paid in taxes to using my right. money to bomb hospitals like that's not okay. That, well, that, where is our anti-war movement in the United States? Because yeah, at least right. in the '60s, people were protesting the Vietnam War with psychedelics. It was peace, love, and we're all brothers. Or is that not yeah. true? Yeah. Well, that's that, that's another way I want to paint that picture with a finer okay. brush because um, you know that's that's true to a point, but really um, another way to look at it is that the psychedelic drugs um, sort of um, upended the anti-war. The anti-war movement was well underway oh, in the okay, early okay. '60s. There was there was the free speech and anti-war and civil rights movement, and they were like SDS, Students for Democratic Society. These were just the smartest people from the best colleges. They were organizing voters, and they were starting to have an impact. And then there was this wave of psychedelia that came in through groups like the Weathermen Underground. Right. And it radicalized the anti-war movement, like an anti-war move. You know, they went from organizing voters and, you know, electing people to Congress to trying to levitate the Pentagon. Like that's, you know, that like the psychedelics had a role, but they were mostly a disorienting role. Interesting. You've probably Interesting. seen this on YouTube. There's a, there's a funny little video on YouTube. You can get LSD being tested on British troops. Have you ever seen this? No. no. It's, so it's a very interesting little thing. So it's a, it's, I'm not okay. sure if it's a real thing, but it looks like it's a real documentary. It's only like five minutes long. And it's a black and white, grainy black and white film of soldiers who are going through their maneuvers, their exercises, and they're given LSD. And so they're, instead of like walking in straight lines and obeying orders, suddenly they're like falling all over and climbing up trees and laughing hysterically. And people use this video to say, oh, see how LSD is good for anti-war. You can't be a soldier if you take LSD. But another way to look at it is that an anti-war movement requires real political savvy an organization, and that's what that's what kind of happened. Like we, like you asked the segment, well, where's our anti-war movement? We don't have an anti-war movement, you know. Like taking psychedelic drugs does not help you organize your life. It helps you walk in nature. 
It helps you become a kinder person, but it's a different kind of functionality, right? It's like a, what therapists use this word, spiritual bypass, Can right? Be, yeah. And so that's something that we have to look at. You know, when I, in some of my teaching, I, I bring up this concept. I love the sound of this word, a Sanskrit word, ashrama dharma. Mm, ashrama dharma, ashram. which means ashrama dharma. Ashrama dharma. Ashrama means stages of life, the truth about the stages of life. And ashrama dharma, you know, the life, a life is divided into sections. You're a student, you're a householder, you're a merchant, you know, you're involved. In order for a society to structure, we need people that are fulfilling all these roles. You got to be, we need warriors, we need soldiers. You don't get into the mysteries. You don't get into your spirituality until later in life when you become a sannyasin. And so what happened, we can, this is an interesting way to look at what happened in modern Western, during the anti-war movement and with the hippies, that they be, people were given, these, given LSD and going into the mysteries before they'd built their house and planted trees and raised their children and I'm, I'm speaking kind of generally here, but you know what I'm saying, that um, it's... Uh, right, and you're th when we talk about some of the other cultures, the way they did it, there was kind of a shaman. There was someone who could consume this medicine and share the wisdom. Maybe it wasn't for everybody. Maybe everybody wasn't ready to experience what some of these earth medicines show us. Yeah. That's a, that's a very important point that you brought up there because there's a lot of this neo-shamanism now and people doing these groups and one person pours ayahuasca for, you know, they're in every city there's 20 of these things going on every weekend, right? Yeah, but in they the say traditional, in LA there's like 500 a weekend. <laughs> there was you know, at one everybody's, point. <laughs> everybody's getting loaded on ayahuasca and they're, they're, they're acting right. like they're reviving an, an, an indigenous tradition, but that's not true. And in, in the indigenous societies it's the shaman that takes the ayahuasca it's not the people he doesn't give you know he the shaman takes the ayahuasca and and he or she goes into the person's energy field and does their does their works with the spirits it's not like everybody is equipped to be a corundero that whole thing has become kind of profaned and flipped around and you know it's worth looking that's another opportunity to practice discernment so you mentioned Washington. So I don't want to. I, I do want to go back because it also ties into the anti-war movement. This uh, I read the book Mary's Mosaic due to a oh. podcast that you had, and this was a story that kind of blew my mind. And I'm mm. curious. Like I don't know that many people know this story, and I'd love you to talk about that because again, that ties into our current political system and what's going on. You know, so very much so. That I think is one of the most important books and one of the most important episodes <clears throat> to understand the pros and cons of psychedelics in modern society. So basically, um, Mary's Mosaic is written by Peter Janey, who uh, became a very good friend of mine and kind of a mentor and big brother for a while. And it's a story that I um, first learned about in Timothy Leary's autobiography in 1983. And Tim, Tim first tells the story that when he was still at Harvard, before he had gotten too outrageous, um, he was visited by a, a very distinguished woman socialite from Washington, D.C., who said, we've heard you talk about psychedelic drugs and that if Khrushchev and Kennedy could only take psilocybin together, there would be world peace. And she and this said- This is Mary Pincher Myers? This is Mary Pincho Meyer, who is a, um, a socialite um, and an, an heiress of a, one of the great wealthy American industrial revolution families. She was married to, uh, separated, but married to one of the founding members of the, not exactly the CIA, but that ilk. 
you know, her sister was married to Ben Bradley, who was the editor, publisher of the Washington Post, real insider, Washington, D.C. insider, socialite, wow. brilliant and beautiful, powerful woman. And she happened to be John Kennedy's lover. Tim didn't know this at the time. And how many years did that affair go on? Does anybody know? That affair went on for, they, were, they first met, JFK and Mary met when uh, Mary was, um, I think she was still in high school. They were, they were just a few years apart. They, were, they knew each other for a long time. Mm, okay. Okay. They didn't become lovers. You know, JFK had a bizarre kind of weird sex life. He right. would just, you right. know, he had a lot of trivial women that he just kind of, fucked around with, but not Mary. Right. Mary was a was a real important person and a confidant and a dear friend. And um, the story is that he was going to divorce Jackie after he was elected to a second term and marry Mary. They had that sort of intimacy and profound connection. And, um, and Jackie knew about her and all this. So Mary shows up at Tim's office to learn how to run a psilocybin session and Tim teaches her and gives her psilocybin. And she goes back and to Washington, have several meetings and um, turns on JFK in the spring of 1963. And um, when I... In, in so, so are we talking about JFK doing psilocybin in the White House? Because this is juicy. <laughs> yes. Is this where it happened? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yep. And um, and it was right at a time, you know, JFK was when he was elected to the presidency. He was he he changed a lot from the time he was elected to midway into his administration. He was elected, you know, kind of on a on a military platform. You know, he was that was the Cold War was going on, and the Russians were the bad guys, and we had to have the biggest military, and they were going to try to. We had to like it was a very contentious sort of um, the same sort of thing that we have today. And then soon after becoming president, he started to really, um, he sort of was radicalized and um, became much more of a humanitarian and much more of a peace activist. And, and it was um, so clearly stated just a few. Um, so he had these psilocybin, the psilocybin experience in April of 63. And then in June of 63, he comes out with one of the most important speeches of his, of any president. This is this is considered by many to be one of the most important speeches ever given by an American president, and it was on June eleventh, nineteen sixty three. So just um, shortly after his psilocybin trips, and I ask everybody to listen to this speech, and it still makes yeah. me cry because to just to hear the inspiration, like like Bobby Kennedy today, this peace speech is not just a political speech; it's a spiritual teaching and a profound one. And JFK announces an end to the Cold War, an end to nuclear testing, that he's going to get out of Vietnam, he's going to start, we're going to have, develop a, uh, a um, relationship with the Soviet Union. And it was, it was a speech and an announcement of an agenda that really could have changed the world. Right. It and was it at was, American University? American and University. was the speech called something like, My Dream of Peace? And I think even in it, he really pointed the finger back at America in the sense of we need to start looking at our own policies. Exactly. And if we cannot be, you know, promoting promoters of peace if we're not looking at our own uh, agendas. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. You know, eliminating the project. He had this death, rebirth, psychedelic experience, and he you know, recognized, you know, the uh, embracing the shadow instead of projecting the shadow and empathy for another. I mean, he gets into it. You got I've listened to that speech a hundred times and it's still, I still get how, new things out of it. How long ago did he, after that, how long was it before he was assassinated? Well, he was assassinated just um, five months later. And Mary Pincher Myers also dead. And then Mary Meyer, um, Mary Meyer. Then the Warren Commission came out uh, with their report that it was Lee Harvey Oswald and Mary Meyer was going to um, raise a fuss about that with all her connections. And then she was assassinated. And they tried to blame that murder on a poor black guy that was in the area. And one of the things that makes 
Mary's Mosaic such a dramatic and important book is that Peter Peter came home from prep. Peter was Mary Meyer's next door neighbor. <clears throat> Mary Meyer's daughter was Peter's best friend. And he was killed in a car accident. And Peter and Mary really bonded. He was, she was like his surrogate mother. She was so bereaved at the loss of her son. And <clears throat> Peter's parents were alcoholics and not very present for him. So they had a very close relationship. <clears throat> Well, Peter came home from prep school one day and overheard his father in the other room talking. His father was one of the founding officers of the CIA, overheard his father talking about Mary, and Peter figured out that his father was in on the murder. Has he ever talked publicly about that? Well, he didn't talk publicly about it. Um, he yeah. went, he just buried it. He developed, you know, he was had anxiety disorders. He was a very brilliant fellow, went to Princeton, and then went and got a PhD in psychology at Boston University, <clears throat> doing research on reincarnation therapies. And then when his father died, he realized, I've got to get out, got to come out with this. And so he just cleared his desk and retired from his practice and um, devoted several years to writing that book. And not only did he write that book, oh, but he- he wrote the book. Peter wrote the Whoa. book. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, a, wow. that's just a powerful- I didn't make that powerful. connection. <clears throat> yeah. He wow. identifies his father as being part of the assassination, goes through the court proceedings, finds out the guy who was the CIA hitman in it and just threw himself into it. I mean, he's such an amazing human being to do this. And it's such an important book to read. I know. It's an important book to read. He's been involved in a process trying to have it become a movie, but the CIA blocks it and you know it's a whole ordeal. But so here's the thing that I like to point out. Um first of all I should say I, I, as I said that Kennedy had that psilocybin experience and I had been under the impression in my analysis of his life that it was that that really kind of catapulted him into being the anti war president that we know him as. Um, his nephew didn't quite agree with me when I spoke about this with with Robert Jr. Robert. Mm -hmm. He said, well, he was he was really on his line was, you'll have a hard time convincing me of that. He was well on his way already. Acknowledge the the psychedelic part of it, and but just said that he was well on his way already. So that's important, that um, psychedelic drugs make you more of who you are. They don't really change your deepest character. And JFK was already on a process of awakening, and so he became, this, this helped. But so here's the other thing. Look, we talked about MKUltra. The, the Kennedy turning on and it expediting his anti-war attitude. That's the best that we can hope for psychedelics. Kennedy gets assassinated in 63, November of 63. The country is in a very somber mood. They just, what the hell was that? And in 1964 is when really the psychedelic 60s began. The Beatles come over, waves of psychedelics start coming over. So we're seeing both. We're seeing the deployment of psychedelics as weapons to somatize American society, distract them from the ugly political reality. But we also see the use of psychedelics as the awakening device. So that's a very loaded moment in, in time there. The, the, the and we're in the same place Kennedy. in a way. And... We're in the same place now. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. 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 Seems I mean, like I'm, it. I mean, yes. I am. I mean, look so... at what's going on in the world in this moment as we sit. What's going on in the world? The Russian Ukraine war and what's going on in Israel, Palestine. I mean, those are just two things currently going on <laughs> among many. Um, and I see why you would get to a point of, as someone who believes in peace, believes in humanity, 
um, I think the one thing that psychedelics also do is they show you that we are truly brothers and sisters connected in ways that are, that our conditioning may not allow us to see. Um, but it is interesting to then also have the acceptance of maybe we are in a, the 3D realm that has dark and light polarity. And how do we as human beings hold that? How do we still hold that there's beauty and darkness at the same time here and terrible atrocities? And with such a desire still to move into the more beautiful world. Yeah. Well, that's our that's our spiritual path right now, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I don't have an answer to that myself. I'm just, I'm just seeing it. And I'm, as I said before, you know, I had this vision, like the worse it gets, the better it gets. That there's this polarity that's- um, The balance you know, that's, of the like that's, dark and light. Yeah, that it's, that it's uh, you know, empowering our evolution. And here we are at this time where more and more people are recognizing our unity while hospitals are being bombed, you know, with our taxes and, um, and the Ukraine thing, I mean, it's just atrocities. And then we have, and then, you know, you and I both share, I think, this incredible promise of the candidacy of, of um, Robert Kennedy Jr. And that he's in my meetings with him, you know, he's just, uh, the guy's an avatar. And his, his words are um, prophetic and, you know, pr very profound and wise. I'm a little puzzled. I'm a lot puzzled by his um, reaction to the Israeli thing yeah. now. What is but, his reaction? I'm curious about that because I've read Char just briefly Charles Eisenstein, as we both know, is working on his campaign and wrote felt compelled to write a piece that he didn't agree with Robert's um, position on Israel and was hoping you know, again, this is what I love about Charles. It wasn't a black and white thing, like, oh, I'm not working for him anymore. It was in the hope that with continued conversations, he would see another side. So what was Robert's stance on Israel? Well, um, first of all, I read Charles' piece also, and I thought it was brilliant. Um, I wanted him to go a little further into one area, but I was very surprised. You know, one of the things about Robert Kennedy's candidacy that I love so much is about overcoming the split in our society yeah. between Democrats and Republicans, this schismogenesis that had been intentionally inflicted to divide us um, and that we people really need to unify against, you know, and he's like, we were just talking about the peace speech of JFK. Well, Robert gave a commemorative peace speech in New Hampshire a couple of months ago that I went to and like so act reactivating that spirit. Like there's a military industrial complex and they're controlling our economy, they're controlling our media, they're controlling our scientific research. They're bit, but it's all part of the vaccine thing. And we need to unify, that's the enemy, not Democrat, Republican fighting like this. And so that's been a major theme of his ca campaign and it's just attracting attention and his popularity is soaring. And so that's why it was very disappointing when this attack happened and um, and Robert issued a statement that um, about the atrocity of the attack. Okay, obviously, but he also um, uh, kind of got on the side of Biden in saying we need Israel. Is Israel needs to defend themselves, and we should provide Israel with all the weapons and everything that they need. And you know, he's fully supporting the Biden response. The Biden's supporting of an Israeli military response, which. Um, Charles disagrees with, and I disagree with, and I would have just loved Bobby to say, this is an opportunity for us to practice just what I've been saying. It's not Hamas, it's not Israel. We are on the side of the people. Those children didn't attack anybody. They don't, they don't no. deserve to be bombed in their hospital beds. No. You know, It's not the people, it's the programming that is the enemy. And then, um, and there's you know, more even at play, potentially, when you really peel back what's going on. Is this really in Iran? Yeah. No, they're going to, they're going to, it's a potential to really escalate into Russia and China are now talking about what they're going to do about it. And like, I, 
uh, it's activated my anti-war spirit more than anything. Like put down your weapons. It's you know when I heard those the hospital bombings, and I don't care who did it. Like the children th- didn't didn't do it. They didn't do it. You know this is. No. Um, and then you know my other interest, of course, is in the the hidden parts of this. Like, well, it's interesting because we just talked about John F. Kennedy and the murder and the CIA. I think the word conspiracy got used during the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And now we have kind of the same kind of silencing in the United States of voices that want to look at things more critically. If you go against the agenda at all, you are considered a conspirator where it's like, can't, why aren't we teaching our youth and our culture to think critically, to look at both sides? What's yep. your thought on the current situation and conspiracy? Well, you know, that's another essay I have half written that I, I do promise to get myself a little more stable and to get some of this stuff out. But that but you've you've sketched it out um, very well that the weaponization of the term conspiracy theory was a direct response to people beginning to question the Warren Commission. We even have a CIA memorandum instructing CIA operatives. We, we know from psychological research that one of the things that people are most susceptible to is ridicule and ostr- being ostracized. And so this was their plan. People that start to question the Warren Commission's bullshit, Lee Harvey Oswald, lone nut assassin, call them conspiracy theorists, make fun of them. And that's Ruin what- Ruin them. <laughs> that's what, that's what, so now people still use the word like, oh, he's a conspiracy theorist, like that's a terrible thing to be. But really, and this is a piece that I'm trying to write, I mean, like <clears throat> before 1964, a conspiracy theorist was a lawyer. That's what you do. You come up with a theory. Like all the, the history is, op- they're all conspiracies. If you're not a conspiracy theorist, what are you? Like the Vietnam War, we know about that from the Pentagon Papers. These are all people breed together. It's the most common crime. You know, if you get when you get busted for smoking weed or having a, you know, a bag of weed, you were never just but you were always busted with possession and conspiracy. You know, intent to sell. There's conspiracy. Like that's how the world operates. That's what social scientists do. You come up with a theory and then you find evidence. You come up with a theory based on data and you come up with evidence and then you prove it. And that's how that's how law advances. That's how history, that's how we study history. And um, suddenly that's become a thing that you're, you know, an, an idiot. Now, don't get me wrong. There are good conspiracy theories. Right. And there are wacky conspiracy theories. Right. Like the wackiest, but in these articles where they say, oh, he's a conspiracy theorist. Kennedy's a conspiracy theorist because he thinks about the vaccines or he's a conspiracy. They never, they never call the people who believe the official story of 9-11, they're never called conspiracy theorists, like they're idiots. I mean, that's a conspiracy theory. It's a completely bogus conspiracy theory. But all this scientific research, oh, conspiracy theorists, they will just want to make themselves seem important, or they have a negative view. I just read one the other world, like conspiracy theorists have a negative view of the world. And that's part of the, you know, like pathologizing people that look at conspiracy theories. But they well, never- it is interesting because when you look at history in and of itself, so many things have been, the truth has been hidden They're on conspiracy. so many levels to, for, to humanity. So to question is our human right, it's our sovereignty. How do we yeah. have a democracy to, act, to not question the, yeah. the beings in power over us? Yeah. That we supposedly elect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I love it. To, I love it when people push back on this notion of conspiracy theory because it is a very yeah. effective linguistic weapon that's been designed by social engineers to prevent inquiry, to thwart inquiry into the deeper operations of our society. And if and well, it, look and at just, COVID. Even if you questioned, is this healthy to put in my body? Just the question alone, which was a natural question to ask, do we have enough evidence that this is safe for me long term? You weren't even allowed to ask. Yep. Is this safe for my children? 
You weren't allowed yep. to ask. It no, was you're... like you were a nut. And it, yep. it, it, what was so fascinating about that is the same people that question like Monsanto and the industrial pharma um, industry suddenly didn't question any of it. Right. I know. It was, it's, it's, so um, it is fascinating. It's mind control. We're fascinating humans. <laughs> it's, it's, and then, and the psychedelics are a very big part of this because the uh, psychedelics can, Leary's and Frank Barron, who was his partner and my teacher, they really thought that popularizing psychedelic drugs would awaken a person's own capacity for discernment and shift. This is, this is an important phrase in this whole, in the psychologizing of this, the locus of authority. Where, where do you get your authority? Do you get it outside of yourself, from the institutions, from the media? Are you obedient? Or are you, or do you have an inner locus of authority? Do you trust your own creative capacity to discern reality? And we're, we're different animals. Some people are just like follow the herd. And some people are naturally more creatively and kind and, and, um, Frank and Tim thought that psychedelics could be the thing that could enliven this capacity to make us less susceptible to propaganda and obedience. And, um, and it, um, unfortunately, it's a lot more complicated than that because we also see, you know, you mentioned that MAPS conference. There, there are pe psychedelics make you hyper-suggestible. We know this. So it's very easy to indoctrinate people using psychedelics. Yeah, I'm actually interviewing a doctor. I think she's in Wired this month, uh, Dr. Gold Dolan, who's really looked at the different medicines like Ibogaine, MDMA, and it's a much longer period after. Like Ibogaine, it's for a month after you experience Ibogaine that you're very suggestive of what mm. you have to be very careful of what you where you put your mind in that time frame. Yeah, it's it is fascinating. These yep. uh these these profound medicines. I guess, you know, we'll have to keep reporting back to each other and uh, finding where we land. I mean, I want to honor your deep work on the topic, your incredible research, your discernment, looking at both sides, uh, your willingness to talk about the side of psychedelics that people aren't willing to talk about. Um, you know, it's like peeling back the sequins off of this gown, <laughs> this, this, you know, glittery gown in the uh, West. Mm -hmm. And um, for also the humility to say, we don't know, we just don't know. And I think that is still the mystery that we don't know whether these medicines have the p potential for more good or not at this point in our culture. And that we both are in a place where we still want to hold this ideal of a world where war doesn't exist. Yep, we're in it. We are in it. We are in the thick of it right now. Yeah. Any last words to an audience member who's listening? Message that you might have. Well, you know, we talked about a lot of things that we we kind of um, dashed around a lot of very profound subjects, and um, I'd love to continue the dialogue. I have a Facebook page, which is public, um, and there are thousands of people on there. We have great conversations. And I also have a Substack page that I am, um, I've got a whole, you know, I started writing a book a couple of years ago, but I, I told you, but um, my house burned down and, my, and I lost my library and all my materials. So I'm still getting my feet underneath me. Where am I going to live? And I'm, it's going to be New England. And I'm going to start writing again. And so there's Substack. And um, because of people like you and others that are sharing these ideas, we're going to, you know, pretty soon have a, a conference, a kind of push back to the MAPS generated profiteering psychedelic conference to really bring out some of these things. So we're going to want a lot of support for that. And um, let's just keep the conversation going. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you so much for being here today. Yeah, thank you for that. I love our connection and um, looking forward to seeing you in a couple of days. Yeah, that's right.